Good evening. Hello. Thank you all for being here. My name is Kristen Owens, and I'm NYU's librarian for African American and Black Diaspora Studies. Um, I have a personal interest in Black visual culture studies, and so I'm very interested and honored to be introducing this program tonight. Um, on behalf of Jordana Mendelssohn, director, and Marina Garday, assistant director of the King Juan Carlos Center, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Carolyn Cahoon's lecture, Colonizing Gestures in the Colonial Gaze in the Images of Equatorial Guinea. Carolyn is assistant professor of Spanish at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Her research and teaching focus on contemporary literature, media, and culture from the Iberian Peninsula and sites of Spanish colonial contact in Africa, specifically Equatorial Guinea and Western Sahara. Her current book project traces how younger generations of Equatorial Guineans and Sahrawis respond through art and activism to the realities of life in post-colonial societies marked by lengthy dictatorships, neo-colonial exploitation, and ongoing illegal annexation. This lecture is happening in conjunction with the center's exhibition, Gabinet Fang, a project about memory, history, and colonial legacies in 20th and 21st century Equatorial Guinea and Spain, uh, which was coordinated by Jorge Blasco, the center's scholar in residence for 2023 and 2024. Support for the Gabinet Fang project and Caroline's lecture has been generously provided by the Center for the Study of Africa and the African Diaspora, and we thank the CSAAD's director, Mike Gomez, especially for his support, the Center for the Humanities, Arts and Science, Teaching and Innovation Grant, and Arts and Science Faculty First Look Program. Following the presentation, um, there will be room for Q&A um, and then a reception. And I'm, now I'm going to pass it on to Caroline. Thank you so much for the introduction, Kristen. And thank you all for being here tonight. Before I begin, I want to adjust the mic so that you're getting me on the recording. Is it good now? <laughs> Great. Before I begin, I want to offer my gratitude to a handful of folks who made it possible for me to be here. Thanks to the KJCC for making the space for the Gabinete Fang, which is a powerful and thought-provoking exhibition, to Jordana Mendelssohn for extending the invitation to come present my work here, to everyone who participated in the realization of the Gabinete Fang project, and to the NYU College of Arts and Sciences for hosting the event that brought me here in the first place. It is an honor to be here. With it being the first day of Native American Heritage Month, it's especially important that I acknowledge that we stand and sit right now on ancestral Munsee Lenape homelands. And while we are a long way from Fairbanks, I also honor and thank the Dene people of the Lower Tanana River for their knowledge and stewardship of the lands where I work and live. My presentation tonight considers the far-reaching legacies of colonial ways of seeing and understanding the world. In our brief time together, I will address some of the complexities and contradictions of some contemporary representations of Spain's colonization of Equatorial Guinea. And I will explore how we might ethically engage with works that carry decolonial messages and celebrate non-European forms of knowledge, but at the same time reproduced harmful colonial logics and practices. The cultural production that anchors my talk is the 2022 graphic narrative Diez Mil Elefantes, or 10,000 Elephants. Like the Gabinete Fang display out there, this work focuses on the memory of Spain's equatorial African co colony, and it revisits the colonial archive to reckon with the past and offer alternative imaginings that recontextualize the documentary and archival traces left by the colonial enterprise. Diez Mil Elefantes portrays filmmaking expeditions taken by documentarian Manuel Hernández San Juan between 1944 and 1946 throughout what was then La Guinea Española, Spanish Guinea. Rather than a biographical or an autobiographical perspective or a historical account told from the Spanish side of history, 
The graphic narrative represents and re-presents this moment from a Ghanaian point of view for, through the first person testimony of Ngono Mba, San Juan's fictional porter. The work implicitly interrogates the romanticizing and exoticizing nostalgic bent of many other recent works of colonial historical memory, and it explicitly denounces the physical, racial, and epistemic violence of the colonial project. It deploys image and narrative to point to the imperial gaze, in particular the impulse to possess and capture through film and the written word. My research joins the work of a number of other scholars, some of whom happen to be here tonight, uh, who attend to the colonial visual archive more broadly and specifically uh, to the work of San Juan and his documentary team, Ermic Films. There has not yet been any research that's published on Diez Mil Elefantes, nor on the film and the novel that preceded it in representing the same historical fiction narrative. Diez Mil Elefantes is a compelling text for discussion, not only because it offers an am ample opportunity to consider the operation and subversion of the colonial gaze, but also because its creation entailed an act of plagiarism that patently replicates the colonial exploitation it decries. Diez Mil Elefantes was published by Catalan journalist Pere Ortin and internationally recognized illustrator and activist, the Ghanaian Ense Ramon Esono Evale, who illustrated La Pesadilla de Obi, which is the first graphic narrative ever published in Equatorial Guinea that uh, criticize and criticizes and caricatures the dictator. And it's wonderful, but we won't talk about that tonight unless you want to talk after. <laughs> the graphic novel Diez Mil Elefantes remediates Alex Guimera's 2015 docufiction film Un Dia Vi Diez Mil Elefantes, or One Day I Saw 10,000 Elephants. Both the film script and the comic script are attributed to Pera Ortin, and they're also nearly identical texts. Ortin claims that the story for Diez Mil Elefantes was inspired by a novel that he had commissioned from renowned and prolific Equatoguinean author Juan Tomas Avila Laurel, a novel which at the time remained unpublished. Ortin calls the graphic novel the fruit of his diverse historical and journalistic research, years of reading, interviews, and archival investigation, and many conversations with his anthropologist friend. The reality, though, is that the comic script does not merely take inspiration from Avila Laurel's story, but rather borrows heavily lifting whole phrases, sentences, and paragraphs directly from the Equatoguinean author's text. So on the left, you can see Avila Laurel's text, and then on the right, you see some of the captions from the comic. And there are a few words changed here and there or replaced with a synonym, but the movement from left to right is really, it's really clear. I was able to trace this because Avila Laurel's novel is no longer unpublished as well. Because novelist Avila Laurel's creative involvement in the Diez Mil Elefantes graphic narrative is not responsibly credited or accurately represented, it's just that brief mention in the uh, epilogue that I had on the screen a moment ago, and therefore he is not remunerated for this project at all, the graphic narrative is scaffolded by a harmful reenactment of extractive and exploitative colonial practices. The production of the comic thus reproduces the very colonial logic that it criticizes. To best explain the extent of this terrible irony, and before fully addressing the polemic of the graphic narrative's production, I will analyze how the work's visuals by Equatoguinean artist Esono Ebale work together with the text to invert the colonial gaze and signal the ambivalence and unsteadiness of social and epistemic hierarchies. I will share images that trouble the presumed stability of the imperial gaze and colonial power dynamics, and that showcase the value of Fang and African modes of seeing, understanding, and representing the world. I will also note the ways the comic's materiality reframes and represents, 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 archival texts and images that were initially and inherently dehumanizing to the Ghanaian subjects. <clears throat> 
As I was exploring the Gabinete Fang digital exhibition before I arrived here, I noticed that there were a number of noteworthy intersections between the histories and respective resurrections of the museum Fitas here and San Juan's films, and I'll also be pointing those out as I go. I'm going to start with a brief sketch of, uh, of Spain's colonial contact with the place now known as Equatorial Guinea and give an overview of Manuel Hernández San Juan's photographic and cinematographic work in the colony. If you had time to check out the exhibit outside with the timeline, you will already be uh, ahead of schedule in this contextualization. In 1777, portions of the colonial demarcated geographic area that's today known as Equatorial Guinea first came under Spanish dominion as a result of a treaty with Portugal. A number of Catholic missionary expeditions in initiated Spanish colonial presence in the Gulf of Guinea, and the moral and religious motive remained a fundamental justification for Spain's presence in Guinea throughout the nearly 200 years of colonial contact. On the cusp of the 20th century, Spain's 1898 loss of its colonies in Cuba and the Philippines sparked national concern for its equatorial African colony, and the Guinean territory was declared a colony of exploitation, quite literally a wealth of opportunity in terms of the uh, potential natural, agricultural, and human resources to be plundered and harvested. Coffee, cacao, and wood, along with human labor, would become uh, the, the principal sources there. Throughout the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, until Equatorial Guinea's 1968 independence, there was a notable acceleration and intensification of Spanish involvement and presence in Guinea. In the 1940s, the Franco regime founded the Dirección General de Marruecos y Colonias, which was the administrating body for Morocco and the other colonies, and IDEA, the Instituto de Estudios Africanos, or the Institute of African Studies, both of which, which institutions oversaw Spain's African colonial holdings and generated propaganda, as well as imperial and scientific research from within, empirical and scientific research from within those colonies also imperial research. As historian Cecile Stephanie Sterenberger points out, Spain's relationship with science and technology was already integral to Spanish rule in Guinea by the early 20th century. And then during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, this knowledge was mobilized in a massive systemic effort to facilitate the governing and exploitation of populations and resources. In the austere post-Civil War years in Spain, it was necessary to justify any diversion of resources from the peninsula and also to, ex to explain why they were extracting so many. And the diffusion of scientific and documentary images helped to rationalize Spanish presence in Equatorial Guinea and, and Equatorial Africa, pardon, and promote the notion that Spaniards at home in the metropole ought to care about the colony. San Juan's moving and still pictures figured into this propagandistic aim. San Juan co-founded the production company Ermic Films in 1941, and then in 1944, General José Díaz de Villegas, who directed the colonial administration, commissioned Ermic to produce documentary films about Spanish Guinea. Along with cameraman Segismundo Pérez de Pedro, scriptwriter and narrator Santos Núñez, and editor Luis Torreblanca, San Juan, who was the team's director, traveled to the colony, and between 1944 and 1946, they produced 31 documentary short films and made more than 5,000 photographs. Incidentally, Diaz de Villegas is also the person responsible for sending to Guinea the primatologist Jordi Sabater P, the man behind the original drawings that were later converted into the museum fichas that we saw out there. The work of both Sabater P and San Juan, scientist and filmmaker, contributed to the production of knowledge about the colony and thus to the colonial archive. When I refer to the colonial archive, I follow other scholars like Anne Laura Stoller and Benita San Pedro who imagine a more expansive knowledge of what the archive is. It's not only the institutional repositories of data amassed by colonizers, but also the processes and practices and policies that determined what would be collected. It's an acknowledgement that those processes and the accompanying motivations should not be understood as monolithic or stable things either. And in this broader sense, thinking about the archive also entails considering the identities and imaginaries that are produced by way of this knowledge production, 
identities and imaginaries that are not exclusively located in the past, as Benito San Pedro reminds us, but the, that reverberate through our present and possible futures. As Sternberger observes, the documentary and scientific images produced and disseminated in that historical moment contributed to the legitimization of colonialism. They taught their viewers ways of seeing, knowing, and feeling towards the other, which have outlived the formal end of colonialism. In referring to these ways of seeing, knowing, and feeling towards the other, she's describing the functions of the imperial or the colonial gaze. The term describes the positionality of colonizers and addresses the ways that European colonial projects availed themselves of a perspectival discourse that classified colonized peoples and places and that resulted in the othering and inferiorization of the people who were already living in the lands that they were colonizing. As post-colonial scholars Bill Ashcroft, Gareth Griffiths, and Helen Tiffins describe, the imperial gaze defines the identity of the subject, identifies it within the identifying, objectifies it within the identifying system of power relations, and confirms its subalterneity or otherness and powerlessness. In European colonial projects, the colonial or scientific gaze toward colonized peoples produced and reinforced racializing hierarchies that place white Europeans above all other people and living creatures. In the Spanish case, the argument that Ghanaian peoples were backwards, simpler, or closer to nature operated in service of the supposedly civilizing aims of the Catholic colonial project. Pardon. It also justified exploiting the labor of Ghanaians because they were not represented as or viewed as subjects capable of more sophisticated tasks. The colonial gaze thus does not exclusively refer to the visual sensorium in a literal fashion, so it's not just referring to vision, but visual media and apparatuses and their ethnographic and propagandistic functions were crucial to the construction and sustainment of the colonial discourse uh, that is the colonial gaze. Images are particularly powerful instruments of this gaze because in part, uh, due in part to the immediacy of visual representation and sight, and the common perceptions that photos and film capture the truth of things. The colonial gaze's subversion is therefore very frequently enacted through representations that make this metaphor literal and demonstrate its ambivalence and instability. Diez Mil Elefantes continuously underscores this connection between the sense of sight and the colonial gaze. The title of the film that Ortin and Esono's graphic novel remediates is One Day I Saw 10,000 Elephants. Here, the testimonial I is not San Juan, the visiting Spaniard who came to see, record, and later display and disseminate images of Guinea, but his Ghanaian portrait. The narrative re reveals and inverts the Eurocentric and ocular-centric gaze and calls its power into question. Crucially, this major structuring element was not a part of the original commission story. Juan Tomas Avila Laurel recalls the moment in 2008 when Ortin presented him with a collection of San Juan's photographs of Guinea, along with three of San Juan's letters. He requested that Avila Laurel write about the sojourns of a Spanish filmmaker obsessed with finding a secret place deep in the forest where he could behold 10,000 elephants all at once and capture them with his camera, of course. The images that Ortin gave Avila Laurel troubled him in a way that resonates with what we can see in the gallery cards in the gabinete. The photos, like the cards in the ex exhibition, contained decontextualized bodies, dehumanized by their anonymity and put on display for scientific or propagandistic purposes. As the author recalls, in the thousands of photos San Juan took, there was not a single caption. They were all nameless Guineans. Relatedly, I noticed that only two of the gallery cards that we can see in the exhibition include the names of the people drawn. Many of them don't feature faces, as you probably noticed, but simply depict tattooed limbs severed from the bodies and stories of the Ghanaians who bore them and stripped of their cultural significance. The preparation of these images and the associated data demonstrates the extractive and exploitative nature of ethnographic studies that were fundamentally dehumanizing. 
the acquisition of knowledge of the place and its people ignored their humanity. Avila Laurel's feelings about the photos are then unsurprisingly quite similar to the reactions of Estela del Carmen Mbesa Alaiz, the 22-year-old Afro-descendant woman who was interviewed as a part of this exhibition. When she viewed the cards, she said, a lot of the context is missing. The descriptions don't say anything. They don't tell a story. They don't say what they represent for the community. It's a super exoticization. I would like it if this retrieval was something done by us, for us, to understand it from the perspective of the Fong culture. It would be necessary to incorporate our gaze into the study, to retrieve the popular memory, and to have it done by the people I represent from the Aquatuganean point of view. That is the opportunity that Juan Tomas Avila Laurel took when he uh, wrote the text, which, as he tells it, opposed Ortin's original intent. He said, I think that mentally he wanted to write about white person once again, but I mentally went against Ortin and I wrote it, giving names to all those anonymous people, since it was something that for me took away from the value of the collection. Why should I delight in these photos of people whose life circumstances are unknown to me, I thought. Moreover, it was high time to talk about Ghanaians and not about a colonist and his fits of madness. Avila Laurel's observations about the colonial photographic archive recall Susan Sontag's reflections on the nature of the photographic medium and its deceptive referential quality. For her, it's impossible to gain understanding of the world or of reality through a photograph. In the narrative, the failure of colonial photographer San Juan to truly understand his inability to see beyond the surface is one of the central themes of the story that Avila Laurel chose to tell first in Los Elefantes en la Luna, which is then the story that Ortin used for the graphic narrative. In Angono's first-person account of the events of the mid-1940s in Spanish Guinea, he describes San Juan, as well as the other Spaniards, as insatiably curious about the Ghanaian people, culture, flora, and fauna. He describes how San Juan wanted to see and photograph everything, including the gathering place of the 10,000 elephants, a barely fathomable ph phenomenon described to San Juan by some Fang elders. Angono, in the story, is surprised that San Juan would believe such a tale, the porter imagines that that quantity of pachyderms would dry a river with their thirst and fill a forest with excrement every single day. So he decides that if they were to exist, they could only possibly live on the moon and fly daily to Guinea. For San Juan, the anxious longing for this impossible vision is a source of recurring distress throughout the entire narrative. And the narrative ultimately demonstrates the limitations of the imperial gaze and its concomitant technologies. Despite all of his efforts to know and capture life in Spanish Guinea, San Juan is unable to perceive the elephants when they finally make themselves visible to the Guinean porter. He has not learned from the Fang elders who learned from their ancestors to see in that way. It's just not available to him. The narrative thus celebrates Fong and African forms of knowledge and calls into question the superiority of European scientific seeing and knowing. San Juan's travels around Guinea are the through line and the literal motor of the story. Angono is propelled to many different corners of his land as he carries San Juan's equipment and sometimes San Juan. Nevertheless, the comic is really a series of interwoven vignettes that Angono tells about himself and about the Guineans he knew and met during that time. Guineans that Avila Laurel saw in San Juan's photos and chose to give names and stories and dignity. Turning now to some of those images and details from the comic and still thinking about all of these layers of remediation from novel to film to graphic narrative, I'm going to analyze how Diez Mil Elefantes represents and interrogates the colonial gaze. Throughout the graphic narrative, the repeated returns to imagery of eyes and visual technologies emphasize seeing, the power of sight observation, and the ambivalence of the gaze. The graphic narrative medium itself also allows a reader to linger longer with these images than a film viewer might enabling a more extended decoding of these compelling and highly symbolic images. The first panel of the graphic novel is an extreme close-up of the face of the story's narrator and protagonist, Angono Mba. 
The panel's shape is a rectangle that op occupies the top quarter of the page and limits the visible area of the narrator's face. So readers find themselves eye to eye with Angono as he introduces himself as the son of Mba Mituwa, the son of Mituwa Mechama, son of Mechama Ndong, and so forth, all the way back to the beginning. The narrator thus meets the eyes of the reader at the beginning of the story. This moment of seeing eye to eye establishes a sense of intimacy between narrator and reader, and it, sig it signals that the story will share what the story, the story that he will share is a sincere and personal account. It's also the way that Juan Tomas Avila Laurel uh, begins his story by giving the previously anonymous Ghanaian a name from the very first line. Following the first panel's eyes, the second panel is a similarly, similarly framed close-up of Angono's mouth. Esono Ebale has chosen to move this frame over in space so that we're not moving straight down the page. If he had chosen to break this down and put the gutter just straight across the middle, it would look like a regular portrait of a face, but he's forcing us to see the movement that's happening here and forcing us to take the time uh, to, to think about these two images separately. We see then that the story is going to depart from the typical orientation of the colonial gaze. We're going to be seeing through the eyes of the Ghanaian and hear the perspective that's been excluded or silenced in the Spanish colonial archive. The perspective then zooms out, orienting the reader to the place, beachside, and showing a crowd gathered before Angono, listening as we are to his tale. Already, this is a very different kind of archive than Ermic films. It's personal oral storytelling that's improvised. Ermic films always had to have everything scripted because of the dictatorship. Uh, the the, the um, censorship would not allow them to film the sound in, in situ. They had to already have the script ready to go. So later pages in the graphic novel will continue to call attention to the contrast between this form of knowledge, personal oral st storytelling, and the forms of knowledge that were privileged by Spanish colonizers, like maps, San Juan's field notes, letters, photographs, and strips of film. The various materials illustrate the overwhelming documentality of the colonial archive, while Angono's narration demonstrates no less attention to detail than the Spanish newcomers. In each of the stories Angono shares, which we can discuss more at the end, the Ghanaian man shows the value of knowledges that cannot be written or photographed, but that must be experienced or shared in other ways. Even more than the film, Diez Mil Elefantes continuously confronts the reader with images that evoke vision and surveillance and that call attention to the observed, the observer, and in many cases, moments of mutual observation. As Ashcroft, Griffiths, and Tiffin write, Surveillance is an important strategy in the practical and discursive constitution of imperial dominance. It's suggestive of the knowledge and power over colonial space, securing stability. For the viewer, sight confers power. For the observed, visibility is powerlessness. Considering the link between power and the surveilling gaze, let's look now at the first panel that depicts Spanish colonial presence in Guinea. It's striking in its reversal of the colonial power balance. We see in the front the silhouette of a Ghanaian man framed by vines and branches and sitting in a canoe. And he's eyeing from afar the towering hull of the white ship that's arriving full of Spaniards. Esono devoted an entire page, a full page vignette, to this image, and he portrays this Ghanaian figure, which we might imagine to be Angono, with care and contour while the distant ship is sketched in with only a few details. On the page that follows, the gaze is returned. Two circles on a field of black show the figures of the Ghanaian observer and another person there. This time, the distance is reduced via the ocular apparatus of the binoculars, which is revealed in the next panel below. And uh, in that panel, we see a man, likely San Juan, standing on the ship's deck holding the binoculars. A little further on, we see him again with binoculars, and this time with pen and paper in hand, holding symbolic instruments of the colonial scientific gaze. <laughs> 
the ocular motif reappears in the following spread. So we've got two or three pages with just binoculars and a focus on vision. So it reappears as the arriving Spaniard once more raises binoculars to his eyes and then gazes upward to the cloud dappled sky that we see in the following panel. But once more, the scene is only barely visible through two touching circles while the rest of the panel is filled with black ink. Both panels that represent this binocular view demonstrate the limitations of sight with this kind of apparatus. It gives the illusion of bringing the object closer, but it also sacrifices so much in the process. The field of vision is reduced, and a great deal is obscured. With just these images alone, we can read a commentary on the ways that colonial scientific and documentary modes might obstruct or distort one's perception of reality. The narration that accompanies these images is significantly Ngono's explanation of the ways the two cultures view and refer to one another. For the Fang, the Spaniards are Ntangan, which he says means ellos, or them, and doesn't make any reference to skin color. On the other hand, the Spanish term for the Fang, negros, led to the temptation of associating us with the things that brought them disgust as though the color of a man could be compared with a shadow on the ground or a stain. Angono's remarks indicate the harm and violence of racial classifications and the juxtaposition with the return of the binoculars restricted view is important. It illustrates the ways racializing perspectives limit what one might perceive and it suggests that large swaths of reality remain unseen and misunderstood when one views the world through the lens of these imposed constructs and categories. Other moments of the graphic narrative foreground the act of observation and challenge colonial hierarchies as they depict the inversion of the gaze with surveillance from a literal bird's eye view. For example, early in his story, Angono enumerates a list of the many sights and sensations that left Spaniards dazzled in wonder at the land. First, the heat, then the sun and the enormous trees, the animals, the customs of the people, the rivers, the plants, and the night birds. This last group, the night birds, he says, return the gaze, they look back, and they call out a reminder, quote, of who is in charge in the forests, end quote. Under colonial rule, observation from on high is typically associated with a colonizer. A viewer with an elevated vantage point has the power to understand and objectify what he sees. In this narrative, the beings who hold this power are not Spanish, nor are they human. The decision to elevate the bird to this position of power nods to the interconnectedness also of the Ghanaian Fang people with the natural environment, a worldview that further on in the narrative is depicted through a full page panel of a spider's web, each thread of life viewed as infinitely connecting with the others. If we consider that the colonial perspective cast colonized subjects as closer to nature, as an indication of their supposed savagery or backwardness or lack of civilization, here we see the power of that proximity to nature being reclaimed. The scheme of avian and animal observation is repeated throughout the graphic narrative. Juxtaposed with images that show San Juan and the Ermic team observing the landscape and inhabitants through cameras or binoculars or with a pen and pad. There are panels that depict the creatures of the forest looking back and often skirting the gaze of voraciously curious colonizers. Coincidentally, a two, page, a two panel game of peekaboo with the reader. So this is at the bottom of a left hand page and then the right side page reveals one of these animals to be a recognizable celebrity, Copito de Nieve, the albino gorilla sent from Guinea to the Barcelona Zoo by none other than Jordi Sabateri P, the primatologist behind the original images of the gabinete behind us. The birds and beasts are not the only ones watching. Angono describes how he looked on at the Spaniards searching for knowledge and meaning they set out to assimilate our mysteries, he said. I watched them and I realized they understood nothing, but they never gave up trying. They wanted to know who we were. His observation of the Ermic team's intense and anxious search is reflective of the idea behind the in Instituto de Estudios Africanos to create a total knowledge about the colonies by looking at them from a plurality of angles. 
Angono's commentary and the eventual failure of San Juan to perceive the spirit elephants nod to the impossibility of this aim. The Fang people and the creatures of the forest possess knowledge and perspectives that remain out of reach for the newly arrived Spaniards. The plurality of angles from which the Spaniards are observed by the human and animal eyes exemplifies the realization of what post-colonial theorist Homi Baba identifies as the threatened return of the look, which breaks down these constructed notions of identity that are built on othering. Beyond the literalized metaphor of looking, the gaze may also be returned through acts of what Baba considers mimicry, in which colonized subjects appropriate and refashion colonial technologies and discourses to their own local needs, destabilizing colonial hierarchies and identities in the process. We can imagine Esono's collage pages as an ex a belated example of this kind of gesture. Here we see the scattered portraits of Equatoguineans, a very small sample of the 5,500 photos that Ermic took. And they've been carefully cut out and interwoven with colorful images of plant and animal life that appear to perhaps be biological drawings like one might find in a field guide. So the appearance here of, and the overlap of these different kinds of scientific images points to the official colonial perspective that the people of Guinea were one more aspect of the environment to be held under the lens and studied as objects and not as individuals. Yet here, freeing them from their original framing and placing them together is transformative. This collective technicolor portrait reclaims images from contexts that sought to control to study, to exploit, and to exoticize. Esono has constructed on paper a community coexisting in harmony with the natural world and with one another. The detail that several of these figures are also Esono's family members, whose names he can say and whose stories he knows, makes this a recuperative gesture that is all the more powerful. I could very easily devote hours to these images and to the stories from the graphic novel, and I would be overjoyed to continue talking about it later. But out of respect for your time, I'm going to zoom back out now to continue talking about the problem of this work's publication. What are we supposed to do with a work that carries compelling and powerful decolonial messaging and images, and that celebrates African perspectives and knowledges, and that showcases the redemptive art of an Equato Ghanaian artist, but that exists in this form because of an act that rehearses an all too familiar colonial pattern. A white European man exploited the labor of a black African man for his own personal and financial gain. Because to say a work is inspired by another work does not imply that whole passages of the inspiration text will appear verbatim in the new work. And that's what we can observe throughout Diez Mil Elefantes. Avila Laurel makes clear that Ortin paid him for the text when he commissioned it back in 2008. But there was no talk of a graphic novel, and there was not a total transfer of rights, which is what has been claimed since then. And as Avila Laurel observes, even if such an agreement had been reached, Ortin could perhaps claim to be the editor or the compiler, but not the author. It's unfortunate that this instance of apparent and unethical authorial imperialism has occurred. How powerful would it have been to see this work? We've got it here. With the names of two Equatoguinean creators emblazoned on the cover. It seems that perhaps that a Spanish journalist's ego got in the way of facilitating that groundbreaking opportunity. Ultimately, I don't know if this undermines the work's message. The message itself is redemptive and decolonial, and at its heart, it's truly Ghanaian. It was created by Avila Laurel and brought to life through Esono's images. The unethical circumstances of the work's publication demonstrate only too clearly the reality that con colonial structures continue to shape the world that we live in. It also further, for me, it further underscores the importance of publishing, reading, teaching, and talking about decolonial works in all of their complexity and messiness in the hope that future appropriative acts might be prevented. And I think there's a lesson here for those who would like to believe themselves to be allies and co-conspirators of formerly colonized peoples. 
As Estela commented of the Gabinete Fong and the possibility of a humanizing reinterpretation of the gallery cards, we have to do these things from our perspective. We can have anyone next to us, but it has to come from us. And I want to end with an optimistic postscript. In the case of Avila Laurel's tale of lunar elephants and Angono, it's made it to the hands of readers, but most specifically, Guinean readers. As he told me, it was published by a small publishing house in Bata, which is in Equatorial Guinea, this April. I wanted to do it this way because it's the only way that the Guineans and the people from Bata might have copies of a story that ought to be theirs. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was really amazing. Um, uh, now is the time for Q&A, um, and I wanted to start off with my own first question. Um, as a librarian, um, um, I found myself thinking over and over again about what your um, journey to discovering this material might have been like. Um, was it discovering the film first, and then that kind of led you to the archive and discovering the graphic novel, or were you having a different kind of experience with the archive where maybe you were looking for something else and then came across some material and then it led you down this pathway. Um, so I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about your experience with the archive and this material and what uh, made you decide to pursue it. So thank you. Thank you for that question. It's an opportunity to tell a long and winding story. I originally saw the film Un Dia Vi Diez Mil Elefantes. That was the first contact I had with the story. Uh, sometime after it came out in 2015. I don't remember exactly when. And that was when I started thinking about this story and wanted to do something with it. But as some of you know, dissertations get in the way of some other things at times. <laughs> um, and I finally had an opportunity in the brain space to think about this project again, really right around the time that the graphic narrative came out. Um, and I was aware of the production detail with the film, that it was inspired by Juan Tomás Ávila Laurel. They really clearly credit him in the film. When the graphic novel came out, he's in the epilogue, and I assumed at first that that might have been some agreement that they had come to together, and it was unfair of me to assume that. Um, I started working on this project, and somebody generous brought it to my attention that Juan Tomas Avila Laurel had written an op-ed in an online newspaper talking about this issue and accusing the creators of this, taking his work as they have. Um, and so I had a lot more to think about after that because I've loved this work and the spirit of this work all along. And it turns out that a lot of the spirit that I loved was what was created by Juan Tomas Avila Laurel. I reached out to him because first I, I've, just, I wanted to know more about this situation and what happened. I could read his words in the op-ed, but I, I felt like there might be more. And he told me little pieces of what happened with the original commission um, and how that, I, those are the quotes that I've included today. So he told me the story of that commission um, and what it was like and what his understanding was of how the text would be used. Um, but his discussions with Pedro Ortin about trying to get further credit for the graphic novel just did not pan out well. Pedro Ortin continues to take credit for these words that are just like, it is so obvious. Uh, it is really, really blatant. Um, but he then let me know that this book existed. This book does not exist really many places and it, this was a, a long and storied journey through random archives he told me that a colleague elisa riso had taught it for her class this year had been, had been able to get a few copies ordered from that tiny publishing house in bata he said i don't even have any copies with me at my home i didn't bring any with me to spain i wanted them to be there so part of me does feel a little bit un, like compromised morally about even holding one of these but they were from a class deposit at uh Elisa Riso's institution, and I was able to get to see one and get to really bear witness to the horrible thing that took place in the creation of this really beautiful book. So it's just, it's, it's been a, a heartbreaking voyage of discovery for me, um, and it started with the film, to answer your question really briefly at the end.
it's so complicated and the artist and the novelist are friends too so it's it's really messy yeah it's really messy Hi, um, thank you so much for, a, for an interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, could you go back to the collage image? Yeah. To me, there seems to be so many like overlapping and intersecting readings of this. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really uh, like the reading you give. Um, and I'm wondering if like a, a sort of satirical and a really kind of dark comedic satirical commentary is sort of embedded in this as well, because I couldn't help but think about the quote you read from one of the earlier colonial texts that wrapped up in one sentence, Guineans, their culture, flora, and fauna. Yeah. Right. And I think, I mean, I'm seeing this as, as a sort of like representation of that, a very satirical one, right? That is simultaneously like doing that, uh, got simultaneously doing that, some of that, um, you know, redemptive work, but also sort of turning this, uh, yeah, I'm just really interested in this. The, the tone of a lot of the work is doing that kind of tongue in cheek where it's reclaiming something at the same time as it's sort of like parading in the same clothing as it. Um, one of the readings that I had of this as I was thinking about this image that I didn't have time to talk about too, there's a, a saint card that comes into play in one of the stories that's later on in the book that we didn't get a chance to talk about, but it really does a lot of the communicating for one of the characters. Um, it's, a, it's a saint card of the Virgin with a heart on fire. Um, and I was looking at that image and thinking about the estampas, these, these saint cards and the ways that they look sometimes. This one isn't as much like this, but there are a couple of other uh, collages that you can see floating around that kind of trigger that idea. It's, they're framed with plants and animals and vines, and then they have people at the center. Um, and I, I don't know if that was an intention uh, with, with the image either, but there, I think one of the really interesting things about the inclusion of these collage pages, there are a couple like this, there are a few more that have torn up maps, is that they're really evocative and open themselves to a lot of different readings of these materials that were intended for a totally other purpose. Thanks for your question and comment. Thank you so much, Caroline, and thank you, Kristen, for your question. Um, my question is also about, um, because this graphic novel has so many kind of intermedial stories behind it, which I really love that you unpacked these different moments of, you know, kind of film and narration. Um, I'm wondering about how much you've engaged within the reception of these different uh, kind of, um, you know, scenes um, and by whom and the difference perhaps in reception of the film and the graphic novel in Spain versus Equatorial Guinea. I'd love to know if you've been able to touch on or hear or read some of those different kind of audience responses to this material. I think I'm especially thinking about um, the work that we did across the hall with the Gabinete Fang and Jorge's observations that he didn't think that that project could yet be um, mounted in Spain. Not not sure about where or how that 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 would be, um, and if that's true, you know, in terms of where and how these materials are shown. So I was just wondering about that part of your research, if you had dove, dove into that yet. This is all relatively new, but I can speak to like parts of of that. So if we're thinking about the layers of remediation that took place where this started really technically as the novel, but the first publicly visible version that we had was Un Dia Vi Diez Mil Elefantes, the movie, that came out either the year before or after or the same year as Palmeras en la Nieve, which was this huge blockbuster film in Spain that also talks about the colonial era and is one of those profoundly exoticizing and nostalgic treatments that I was mentioning earlier on. So those two movies came out basically at the same time. One of them was super widely received and popular. The other one was kind of just like barely noticed by the people who are already interested in documentaries because it was classified as a documentary even though the main character who's speaking to us is a fictional character. It was one of those interesting like metafictional moments where no one knew exactly what kind of work they were dealing with. And I think that it kind of flew under the radar a little bit because of that. And partially because there isn't this kind of, uh, Palmeras en la nieve was like really sexy. So it was easier to sell this story for, that there's not as much of a collective memory available for to be able to process like 
you and Jorge were apparently talking about. Um, so that's one thing that I can think about in terms of reception is that the film was released and it kind of didn't get a ton of attention. The graphic narrative, the graphic novel has received a massive amount of press attention, quite possibly because it is a journalist who is involved in the publication and he's got the networks readily available to talk about it. Um, and that is why it's really hard for Juan Tomas Avila Laurel to get his voice to even be heard over the din of the excitement around what is truly a beautiful piece of work, but it's just being published with the wrong name on it. Um, so it's it's made a lot of noise. There are people who are really excited about a historical memory project coming out and having at least one Equatoguinean name on the cover, but that's the thing that is the most frustrating to me about this is that it would have been so much more powerful if somebody had stepped aside. Um, so it's gotten a lot of a huge reception. I did not know that Elefantes en la Luna had been printed and published until I reached out to the author himself. And I think that that's part of his intention. You know, he wants it to be in Ghanaian hands. He probably doesn't love that we've got it for uh, for my personal and academic use, but he does, I think he appreciates that we're, we're teaching it and talking about it, but it's for the Ghanaians. He printed it in Bata because he wanted it to be theirs because it's their story that he wrote about and for them. Um, so that there has been very little, uh, and and there's really not been anything about it. People mention the novel in news stories about the other media, but it's always as an unpublished work. So I don't know. This is like a kind of like an unformed question, but I guess like like what do you like view like the place of art that like has been created in like a post-colonial lens? Like obviously not by the people that like were most affected by like the colonialism like what do you view like that place of art to be or like how can you I don't know how can you participate in indulging in that while also acknowledging the history um and again not being like in a really I like being critical of the art while also like appreciating it because there's lots of different countries around the world who have had art pr produced by people who were not directly affected by the history but it's still celebrated um and revered I don't know that is such a beautiful question. And I don't think that there is a really simple answer to a question like that. I think it's approaching art. If it's art, so like in this case, it's made by an Equatoguinean man and we can celebrate that because he is reclaiming this piece of his own heritage and history. And that is what we would like to see more of. In the case of the kinds of art that I think you're talking about, this like from the angle of the colonizer or from a, like the, the superior col colonizer position, um, I think we have to do exactly what you did in your question, which is approach it with all of those things in your hand. You can say, you know, this is beautiful and also I'm aware of the history and the complexity and also what am I not seeing and whose voices am I not hearing? So when you can look, when you look at those things, thinking about what isn't is a really important way of, of understanding those, uh, those texts, those archives, that art. And it's an awesome question. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Caroline. We really enjoyed this.